Today I'd like to talk to you about, we, you know, we've talked about menopause and beyond as a title, the mature woman. Um, I'd like to thank Davis Hospital and Medical Center for hosting us and also my employer, Tanner Clinic. My clinic is out in Syracuse. I'm in one of the satellites with Tanner. Uh, a couple of shots here just of uh, the mature woman. Today I'd like to uh, just run over the objectives. The first one we'll talk about today is defining the phases of a woman's life. Um, the, the second, third, and fourth objectives I'm going to kind of lump together in the middle of the presentation kind of integrate those things. The second objective, discussing changes associated with menopausal transition, um, explaining how to optimize health surrounding menopause and treatment options. And then my very last slide will just be a few important take home points that I hope you'll remember uh, as you leave today. So going back, our first objective, defining the phase of a woman's life. We'll start early with uh, birth. Uh, the reproductive years, this would cover you know, roughly depending on when a woman's first period is, a young woman's uh, age 12 and then ending into the mid to late 40s would be the uh, reproductive years. Menopausal transition, I think this is a good topic applicable for, for us. Um, mid to late 40s, age 47 kind of being the average age of when this uh, uh, menopausal transition begins and going on to the early 50s. And then in the early 50s you have menopause, which is defined as beginning when one year after the la your last period. And average age of menopause, 51.5. At the latest, most women will reach menopause by age 56. Of course, there are always going to be exceptions. So to kind of keep hopefully like a little more interesting, I'm going to be a little interactive and ask you some questions. Um, it's not really a serious quiz. I didn't bring candy bars or anything I should have. I don't know if that... <laughs> So first of all, what is a follicle? Anybody have an idea what a follicle is? Follicles are in the ovaries, and then there are hair follicles, right? We're going to talk about ovarian follicles today. So a, a follicle is a collection of cysts that contains an egg or an oocyte. And so th I think this is really fascinating because when I first learned this, I was really surprised how many follicles a woman actually is born with. So in multiple choice fashion, is it as many as 2 million, 18,000, 3,500, or is it 40 to 50? 2 million. So that is a, that is a large number uh, of follicles. I've circled primary follicles, which is more of the starting point of what a follicle. And then you kind of follow along um, the life cycle of an ovary, of, a, of an ovarian follicle, progressing to an oocyte, secondary follicle, Eventually, one follicle is going to take over as the dominant follicle where ovulation will occur. And as you see here, here's an oocyte that's been ovulated. And that's going to hopefully float down the fallopian tube and have the opportunity to be fertilized. And then afterwards, you have a corpus luteum, which is what remains after a follicle has been released. So we've all heard of ovarian cysts. Ovarian cysts are very common. And this is often a common cause of where ovarian cysts come from, is this corpus luteum. If it doesn't resolve on its own, it can persist. It can grow and over time cause pain and other symptoms. It can also put some weight on the ovary and cause the ovary to twist or torse, and that can cause quite a bit of pain. Question? Um, I was told I had a, a cyst rupture okay. in an ovary. It have been like at first, the surgeon said it burst open yeah. and that they had to completely remove the ovary. But Okay. It could have been. So the question is, you know, someone who has a cyst rupture, could it be caused from a, a corpus luteal cyst that just persists? Yes, that's very common. Common, you'll see a lot of ER visits, especially like in our adolescent population, and you, you do an ultrasound, you see free fluid in the abdomen, you, you have to kind of a, attribute that to a possible possibility of a, a cyst rupture, so absolutely. So again, the female infant, two million follicles at birth, this is just a similar slide, kind of more of a cartoon uh, depiction of what we just talked about. But again, you see the uh, progression this way going kind of counterclockwise, again, to that corpus luteum at the end, starting as a primary follicle, and again, ovulation over here. So follicles in life phases. Follicles are going to obviously change dramatically as, as a person ages. So again, I'm beginning with 2 million. By puberty, that number is already reduced to 400,000. During the reproductive years, they deplete at a rate of about 1,000 per month. Why? 
That's a good question. So what happens is a, it's a phenomenon called cell apoptosis, where the cell has a programmed death and the follicle never actually releases an egg. And so they'll just deplete and never even be part of the ovulation process. So it doesn't even mean that uh, you'll have 400,000 opportunities to ovulate. It's, it's more like 40, 400. And, and there it is at the bottom. So only about 400 follicles are released over the lifetime that become the dominant follicle ovulation. So, you know, that gives you a limited chance of, of conception too. How much do they go a period? How much do you lose? Usually, well, per period, so it's about 1,000 per month that you lose in follicles up until age 35. And then that rate actually increases after that but only one per period is gonna be uh, the ovulation. Occasionally there's exceptions to that, but generally one. It's just like a little shameless plug. This is my youngest from birth. He's now five. This was taken at Christmas. So let's go to the middle section now. Um, yes? So when, on women that don't ovulate, is that a reason why? Is their follicles are, are they associated? Yeah, that can be. I mean, a common condition, you may have heard of like polycystic ovary syndrome. Um, a lot of those women don't ovulate, and a lot of reasons go into that, but they have so many small follicles. One never actually takes over. Often it's due to progesterone uh, or estrogen and progesterone deficiencies. So, so if you take those, um, um, what were those birth control sticks that they put in your arms? Uh, now they have the Implanon or Nexplanon. Before the Norplant was the old one. When they have, when they put those in, and you don't have periods right. for like 15 years, uh -huh. you, what happens to all those? Uh, you can you can still maintain those follicles. So, they stay in there? but a lot of them, like the, they they're, a lot of them, are programmed for cell death too. So some of them are just like we said, you know, about a thousand per month are just gonna just die on their own, so. And then how do they come out if you don't have a period? Eventually, we have the follicles. They'll just, they'll, atresia or a kind of a shrink, shrinking process will take place and they, they die. And so they're not really gonna, they're, they're very small. We're talking on a cellular, cellular level. If you compare also like a premenopausal ovary to a postmenopausal ovary, there's usually gonna be a significant size decrease after menopause in the ovary, so. The middle uh, three objectives here is what we'll go to next. And again, I'm gonna integrate these three things. So changes associated with menopausal transition, um, how to optimize health surrounding menopause, and then treatment options. So another little question, average age of onset of menopausal transition. So this is when the beginning of menopausal transition. It's not menopause, but we mentioned it earlier. Yeah, 47, exactly, so. So what factors can cause menopause to occur early? So smoking, I'm showing a cigarette slicing an ovary. Um, it, it's not very logical, but. So if a, a woman who smokes may experience menopause up to two years earlier than average. Chemotherapy, which obviously is you know, out of someone's control, but if you've undergone chemotherapy, menopause may occur uh, even, more, even earlier than two years. Same thing if you had radiation, especially in the pelvis, that can also cause premature ovulation. The number of ovarian surgeries can, uh, every time uh, an ovary is operated on, you're gonna be killing cellular tissue. Tissue is gonna have to, you know, whether it's endometriosis, common condition, ovarian cysts, every surgery uh, puts you at a risk of having menopause occur earlier. And then race, ethnicity. Um, Hispanics and African Americans tend to have menopause just a little bit earlier. Caucasians about 51.5, and then Asians, Japanese, Chinese especially, a little bit later. So quick little science slide here of what happens with uh, hormone production. So it starts in the brain, which are these two, slide, two, uh, these two sections here. The hypothalamus releases a hormone called gonadotropin-releasing hormone, acting on the pituitary gland in the brain, which releases LH and FSH. And this, these two hormones will travel to the ovaries and, and where estrogen and progesterone is produced. So with, uh, as time goes on, as estrogen production begins to decrease, lower levels of estrogen in the blood, a message is sent back to the brain saying, hey, we need to, we need to crank up some stimulation of FSH and LH to increase our estrogen production. And that's what will happen. So initially, when menopausal transition begins, estrogen levels can actually be a little bit higher. 
And then the lab that is probably most accurate at diagnosing menopause would be an FSH level. Again, that FSH level, when it detects lower estrogen levels, it goes into hyperdrive, and so your FSH levels after menopause are increased. Usually an FSH level of 25 or higher is suggestive of menopause, um, and you've probably heard of women who have gone into premature menopause where FSH levels can be uh, even 10 years before age 50 in the 40 range. So, so some changes. Um, very common for periods to become uh, irregular. We'll get into more of these. I mean, this is just a list and we'll start talking about some of these um, individually. Vasomotor symptoms such as hot flashes, bone structure changes, cardiovascular changes, uh, teeth, dental, breast, sleep dysfunction, libido, sexual dysfunction, and then also the bottom was urogenital. So going, we'll spend a little more time on the, other, on the first few topics and then kind of skim over the other ones more, but I felt like these were more important. Uh, menopausal transition, unopposed estrogen. We just talked about how when the brain starts detecting lower estrogen levels, FSH production increases, causing increased estrogen production. So initially, you may get more estrogen and lower amounts of progesterone, which means ovulation may not occur as often. And that's common during menopausal transition. You're not ovulating as predictably every 28 days or, or close to that. As a result of anovulation, periods become irregular and heavy. And the worst case scenario would be endometrial cancer. Estrogen unopposed without the helpfulness of its sidekick progesterone can allow the endometrial tissue to proliferate. So this endometrial tissue can thicken. And in the worst case scenario, if you're having heavy periods, uh, endometrial cancer can occur. That is why if you're having these types of symptoms that are much heavier than a normal period, it's important to have an evaluation from a GYN to ensure that there's not, you know, to get a biopsy and ensure there's not an endometrial malignancy uh, ongoing. Vasomotor changes, hot flashes. So, <laughs> most common side effect of menopause, most common symptom of menopause, hot flashes. Up to three-fourths of women are going to experience hot flashes. Uh, you, they can occur two or more years before your final period. So you hear, I mean, it's common you hear women will say in their 40s, they're starting to feel hot flashes. Um, 85% of women will experience hot flashes that last, uh, that goes on for more than a year. Um, 25 to 50% of women's hot flashes will last for five years. And actually 15% will last more than 15 years, which is frustrating because you're asked the question, when are these gonna, going to end? And you really don't know. It, it's, so that is, you know, of course, the, less, the more unfortunate category of if your uh, hot flashes last beyond 15 years. Very frustrating. And you're often asked as well, what causes hot flashes? But even after research, the cause is, is poorly understood. Um, we know there's increased temperature. That's, that's, that's been documented. Your actual body temperature does rise. Blood vessels will dilate near, near the surface of the skin and cause that heat release. Uh, heat wave comes over the whole body and it's, and it's most common in the upper arms, um, upper body and in the face. And of course, working hand in hand with this is that hot flashes can affect your sleep and make you more tired. If you're not sleeping as well, you can have daytime uh, somnolence or daytime fatigue. <coughs> Treatments. So hormone replacement, probably number one. I've given you a handout to hopefully alleviate some of the concerns about hormone replacement. Early in the millennium, when the Women's Health Initiative came out, there was a big scare on hormones because this study was actually terminated early because they felt like it was gonna significantly increase the risk of breast cancer for one. If you look on the tables there though, uh, you see that you know, the numbers aren't quite as frightening as once believed. It's still recommended that if you do do hormone replacement that you begin on the lowest dose that is effective for you. So you don't wanna jump initially to a higher dose, but, but you, know, you take into consideration family history, your own personal history, and then determine if, uh, if it's worth it. If your symptoms are miserable, making you miserable enough, it may be worth uh, uh, starting some hormone replacement. So these could include estrogen with or without progesterone. If you have a uterus, you cannot just take estrogen by itself. You have to take progesterone with it. If you've already had a hysterectomy, then you can have estrogen alone. Some antidepressants can also help with uh, hot flashes. 
I typically do not like to give hormone replacement in women who, are, who use tobacco uh, because it increases the risk of things like deep vein thrombosis, stroke, pulmonary embolism, basically blood clots uh, forming in the body. So there are a few antidepressants that have been shown to help with the symptoms of hot flashes. And then, easy for me to say, a positive attitude. <laughs> so, I think this woman kind of epitomizes the positive attitude, but says, if you can't read it, I don't have hot flashes, I have short private vacations in the tropics. <laughs> this is my second youngest, Matt Dehi. We're not like a really athletic family, but he did score a game-winning goal once, so that was his uh, game-winning goal day. <laughs> the next topic is bone structure uh, changes. So the rate of bone loss increases as your estrogen begins to diminish. Why? <clears throat> Why? Estrogen is protective. It allows for bone density. Let me show you a picture here. Estrogen actually helps building the tissue in the bone. It helps slow down. There's osteoblast and osteo, <coughs> excuse me, osteoblast and osteoclast activity. Osteoblast helps with bone formation. Osteoclasts cause bone reduction or uh, reduced density in the bone matrix. So estrogen actually helps slow osteoclast activity and keep your uh, bone density. Of course, if your bone density becomes, you see how this has the looser space where there's less density, you're now at increased risk of fracture. The most common areas where fracture occur due to osteoporosis are the hip, the wrist, and the spine. Can you ever get that back? You can get some back, yeah, but it's probably not, it's not likely to get back to more of the reproductive density, uh, uh, meaning the density of your bones went during the reproductive years. So. But there are medications and treatments for it. Um, one way of helping diagnose osteoporosis and osteopenia is uh, the bone mineral density exam. So if you do not have any risk factors at all, when is the first time you should get to undergo a bone min mineral density exam or a BMD? So this is for a woman who has absolutely no risk factors for osteoporosis, so meaning non-smoker, um, never had a fracture, uh, before due to, in those areas that we talked about, hip, wrist, and spine. Age 65 is the latest that you'd want to get your first uh, bone mineral density exam. But anyone who has, I'll, I'll give you some uh, list of risk factors later on, um, should get one about age 50. So which of the following is not considered a way of preventing osteoporosis? More than a 10% weight loss at age 25, so so a woman who loses a bunch of weight at age 25. Calcium, calcium intake, vitamin D intake, and diet with protein. Or uh, physical activity with the other choice. So these are, which of the following ways not considered a way of preventing osteoporosis? Actually it's a, it's kind of a trick question because if you had a dramatic amount of weight loss in your 20s, that does put you at an increased risk of having uh, lower bone density. Everything else on the list is considered something that can be protective. Um, physical activity, cardio both, and weight resistance are both considered protective of your bone density. So importance of, uh, of weights in there and some sort of resistance exercise. Leading cause of death in women. Correct. The answer is B. So breast cancer, cardiovascular disease, colon cancer, or motor vehicle accidents. The leading cause of death in men and women is cardiovascular disease. So that could be heart attack, stroke. Um, so just a little depiction here. This is a coronary vessel leaving the aorta. And you can see that with plaque, with cholesterol, the artery, the actual opening inside the arteries is narrowed. We've seen, I think everybody's probably seen pictures similar to that, whether it's in a book or on TV. Most effective way of preventing cardiovascular disease, estrogen replacement, stem cell therapy, physical activity, vitamin D and calcium. Oh, I gave you the answer, sorry. So I jumped the gun. So physical activity. Stem cell therapy, I just made that up. Um, I don't think that anybody does that, so. Uh, estrogen replacement, um, 
we talked about uh, estrogen, actually we talked about estrogen for bone density, but estrogen has not really been shown, and that's on the handout too. There's not really a significant difference if you take estrogen in your cardiovascular health. So physical activity, the most important thing. Um, one of the most common uh, predictive factors of having a cardiovascular event is actually the waist circumference. So there's a lot of focus in, me in medicine now in, in trying to combat metabolic disease. So waist circumference, inactivity, um, a sedentary lifestyle, uh, overeating, things like that, obesity, so. That waist circumference, does that hold for men and? Men and women, yes. Yes, it does, absolutely. Uh, there was a study, because this is a little controversial, Weight gain at menopause is not an effect of hormonal changes. Let me stop at that statement because that's a little confusing because a lot of, I mean, there's a, obviously a tendency that you want to say, well, I'm menopausal, so I'm automatically going to be gaining weight. It doesn't have to be. Um, the bigger effects are diet, exercise, but it is true that your metabolism does slow down at the age of menopause, so, or in the menopausal transition years and postmenopausally, so. So metabolism is slow, but there are ways that we can keep that up. Uh, diet and exercise being one. A diet that's gonna help keep your metabolism higher is probably the non-traditional diet of what we're accustomed to. Of course, we tend to do three meals a day that are usually larger. If you could somehow cut each meal in half and eat every two to three hours, like a two to 300 calorie meal, your metabolism is not gonna be tanking down so far. I had a patient in the past, um, weighed about 350 pounds and said it was genetic, there was nothing she could do. She was in her 30s, and she says, I only eat once a day, I mean, and I'm still overweight. I mean, that's, that was a problem right there for me. So we tried to set a goal, and haven't, you know, hasn't been enough time elapsed yet to see if it's gonna work, but at least a five to 10% uh, uh, weight loss goal. But it can be done. Genetics does play a role in weight and your body uh, habitus, but it can be overcome. Dental changes, we'll just kind of briefly talk about this. Um, again, estrogen begins to be reduced. Atrophic changes of the buccal epithelium, the tissue inside your mouth. Atrophic meaning tissue becomes thin and dry, uh, which can result in decreased saliva production, decreased sensation, sometimes a bad taste, cavities and tooth loss. So it is more common to get cavities uh, after menopause. Breast changes. Um, Mammograms are something that we recommend starting at age 40, regardless of family history. Uh, reduced breast, breast tissue occurs around that time. Prior to age 40, mammograms are not as useful because a woman's breast tends to be more dense. But after menopause, that more dense tissue is replaced with more of a fatty tissue, so easier to detect lumps and things with mammogram. Prior to age 40, sometimes mammograms can be helpful. Ultrasound is common, breast ultrasound. And even there's an increased use of MRI uh, for diagnosing breast disorders. <clears throat> so again, back to the breast changes one more time. I didn't put this on there, but age 40 is when mam mammograms should begin. A few years ago, there was kind of a little uh, controversy on this as well when the United States Preventative Task Force suggested not starting mammogram screening until age 50 and then doing it every one to two years. But most of the other societies did not adopt that, including the American Cancer Society, American College of OBGYN, so age 40, once a year, from age 40 on. Question in the back. Well, what about after like 60, 70, 80? Is it still good to get it once a year? It's still recommended that you have a yearly exam, a clinical exam, monthly self-breast exam, and mammograms, yeah. The risk of breast cancer in a woman's lifetime, I should have put this up, it's pretty high. I mean, without a family history, it's still one in eight. So that's more than 10%. What about, um, <clears throat> what about, what's heart disease? Your, um, one in one. I don't know what the rate is. It's higher than that, but I'm not sure. Do you know? No. Okay, I'm not. Anybody know what heart disease is? What about um, getting your regular checkup if you right. don't have if you're through menopause? So still recommended that you have a yearly exam, even even if you're even if you have had your uterus removed. A lot of women still have ovaries. Uh, obviously, the breast exam you can do routine lab work at that time cholesterol, make sure you're not anemic, check your electrolytes, thyroid, urine, other things, um, diabetes screening. So it's still recommended. That's why, I mean, it's, it's intuitive, but the annual exam 
we do recommend once a year. So, so. Okay, so libido changes. Um, also conflicting evidence on this one. So one study said that decreased sexual interest after menopause. They, they said, okay, we'll, we'll accept that. Um, but then they looked at other factors. Physical and mental health seemed to be, there was a lower priority in maintaining health, uh, smoking, and marital satisfaction. All these things can play a role in how, much, uh, how great a woman's libido is. So they, this study determined that it's not menopause that's causing your libido to decrease, it's other factors in your life. So another study accepted the same thing. Okay, there is decreased sexual, after, sexual interest after menopause. Um, they said they did a poll on women. They were having fewer uh, sexual thoughts, fewer uh, satisfying experiences sexually, and their vaginal, their own natural vaginal lubrication, lubrication was uh, decreased. So that second study determined it was menopause. So, I mean, it's hard to say whether menopause truly, you know, does affect your sexual desire because of the conflicting evidence, but there are treatments. Um, estrogen and progesterone replacement would be a good place to start. Testosterone is becoming more um, popular too. Uh, it's, it's only FDA approved for men right now. So the controversy again is, do you give women testosterone? Obviously on average, a man's sexual libido is greater than a woman's. So the controversy is, is there that I mentioned, um, partly because of all the side effects, and this is a long list of side effects. Skin changes, acne or oily skin, male pattern hair loss from the scalp, hirsutism, where you can get facial hair growth and on the body in areas like the chest, inner thighs, back, abdomen, mood changes, anger and hostility, uh, shrinking breast size, uh, deeper voice, irregular mens menstrual cycles if you're still having periods. Increased size of the clitoris, higher cholesterol levels, and then possibly an increased cardiovascular risk. So this is the list of things that I give my patients when they, when they opt to start testosterone treatment. The one that I've had the greatest success with, and when I say personal response, I'm not talking about my personal sexual response, I'm talking about with my patients, <laughs> is the uh, testosterone injections. So that one I've... I've seen women experience greater energy, you know, less fatigue, and a greater libido with that. So, but again, the side effects you have to really take into consideration and weigh that out. If you're willing to, you know, possibly experience one of these side effects, you have to kind of perform that own personal cost benefit analysis. My third son, I have boys only. <coughs> Urogenital changes. So we talked about atrophy of the mouth earlier uh, for dental changes. There's also atrophy of the uterus. The uterus tends to be smaller after menopause. The vulva, which is considered the uh, tissue outside the vagina, so this could be the mons, uh, bladder, urethra, which is the opening where urine flows outside of the bladder, pelvic musculature, mus musculature in the fascia, um, and then also less support. So as this tissue becomes thinner and drier, the ligaments can tend to loosen, and a woman can experience uterine prolapse, or relaxation of the uterus where it comes down into the vaginal canal. Treatments can be sometimes as simple as uh, estrogen treatment, whether that's oral or sometimes a vaginal estrogen. Probably many of you have heard of vaginal Premarin cream. A pessary. If a woman has a uterus that's prolapsing, back on, thanks. If a woman has a uterus that's prolapsing, uh, and does not want to undergo surgery, one option is a pessary. A pessary is a rubbery plastic device that can be inserted by the, pa by the person themselves into the vagina and then taken out about once a week to clean. Common in a patient who may be a high risk for surgery, but a lot, a lot of women don't really like the idea of a foreign body in the vagina that they have to take out and clean all the time. Um, and then finally, if you're fed up with it and the prolapse is significant enough, you may consider hysterectomy with a vaginal wall repair. So with menopause and this atrophy, sometimes the bladder can also be prolapsing down along with the uterus and even the rectum can be protruding into the vagina. Some women will have to actually splint or use a couple of fingers to push down on their colon to have a bowel movement because of the pressure that's inside the vagina. So here's a little depiction of a normal uterus. Here's the vagina right here. Here's the urethra. Here's the bladder, pubic bone vaginal opening here. Here's where the uterus should be if there is no prolapse ongoing. Back here is the colon and then you see the spine, sacrum. 
Here's a prolapsed uterus. Notice where the position has changed from inside the abdominal cavity. Now it's actually protruding outside. So most prolapse is not this severe. They have, there are four stages of prolapse. So stage one prolapse will be about here, stage two about here, stage three here, and then you see like a full stage four prolapse, the most severe. Urinary symptoms are common. Burning with urination, frequency, urgency, uh, sometimes incontinence, stress incontinence, meaning you lose urine with coughing, laughing, sneezing. Trampoline is a common thing, running. Uh, and recurrent urinary tract infections. So let me go back to this for just a sec. So often, I mean, I've had a woman come in in her 60s in the last year and saying, you know, I've had recurrent urinary tract infections and I don't understand why I'm drinking cranberry juice. I'm, I'm clean. Uh, but it's, the, it's that same thing. It's the atrophy or the thinning and drying of the tissue. As, she, as soon as she was started on vaginal primarin cream, her urinary, traction, uh, urinary tract infections resolved. So finally, we're getting to the last portion here is just these take-home points. Some of them we've mentioned already. Uh, number one, diet and exercise. It's a big thing for me. When I moved to Utah, uh, June 2012, I rolled into town about 275, and I, I blame some of that on the stress of residency and not sleeping well and eating a lot of cookies. <laughs> I'm a stress eater. So I'm down about 40 pounds, but still some work to go. But if you have a BMI over 30 like mine was and still is close to it, um, I think it's a good idea to set a goal. I told you about that overweight patient who said there's nothing that she can do to lose weight, but set a goal to lose 10% of, of your weight in six months time. That seems like a kind of a big, maybe insurmountable challenge, but I, I know you can do it and, and there's a lot of ways. We talked about smaller meals, keeping your metabolism up, and then the importance of exercising. If it's walking, even walking can help with osteoporosis. So. Mammograms, we talked about there, the controversy with the U.S. Uh, Preventative Task Force and American Cancer Society, American College of OBGYN. It starts at age 40 and it's once a year. Just in the, in the operating room recently, I heard about a 25-year-old woman who was diagnosed with breast cancer, so it can be at early ages. You may have heard of Angelina Jolie kind of made it popular with the BRCA gene, the BRCA1, BRCA2 genes. If that's in your family, your breast cancer risk skyrockets quite a bit, up to 70 to 80% of lifetime risk. So a lot of those women will opt for a prophylactic or preventive mastectomy. And you've heard of that happening. So. so if it's not in your family, still mammogram starting age 40. And remember the lifetime risk of breast cancer is one in eight women, which is why the question that was asked earlier, if mammograms should continue into <coughs> even older ages, 70s, 80s, yes. Um, colonoscopy without a family history, First colonoscopy should be age 50. Um, my dad had one recently. He said that he had some benign polyps. He's just barely 60. But he told me that the, the doctor told me I need to get my first colonoscopy at age 40, any first degree relative. So, so age 50 is usually as often the starting point, but it can be earlier. So check with your relatives. Look at your family history. If there's a family history of colon cancer, there's a good chance that your screening needs to be done before age 50. Bone mineral density, we talked about age 65 if you lack risk factors. And then hormone replacement, that handout again, I don't want you to be too afraid of taking hormones if it's going to make your life a lot better. So please see that handout. Um, this is my oldest. And again, I thank Davis Hospital Medical Center for supporting, sponsoring this event, and my employer, Tanner Clinic. Appreciate your attendance. So. Any, any other questions, come on up.